Hello, my name is Henry Neiman from the University of Oklahoma. Um, this is part of the Cluster System Administration for non sysadmins session uh, led by Jeanette Tillinson. And um, this is what's a cluster and how do we parallelize across it? Okay. So we'll, we're gonna break this down into what's a cluster supercomputer. Then I'll give you an analogy for parallel computing across multiple servers, multiple nodes. And then I'll um, connect that analogy to actual distributed parallelism. So what's a cluster? Well, if you saw Pirates of the Caribbean, and by this, I mean the first one. Um, if you saw Pirates of the Caribbean, there's that scene where they're marooned on the desert island and it's nighttime and it's a big bonfire going and they're drinking the rum. And Captain Jack Sparrow says this, he says, what a ship is, it's not a keel and a hull and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. But what a ship is, what the Black Pearl really is, is freedom. And then he curls his mustachios and passes out. So what a, a cluster supercomputer, an HPC cluster is, well, what it needs is it needs a bunch of computers, um, we call them nodes, hooked together by a network, we call it an interconnection network or an interconnect for short, and you'll hear that terminology tossed around. Um, you need some software so that those nodes can communicate with each other over the interconnect. But what makes it an HPC cluster is not that it has those parts. You can have a system with all of those parts and that's not gonna do it. What makes them a cluster is that all those pieces believe so hard that they're one big computer that it actually becomes true. And what I mean by that is they don't become a supercomputer. They don't really become an HPC cluster until all of those parts, or at least a big subset of those parts are working together to solve a problem much bigger than any one of them could do on their own. Now, this was our very first cluster at University of Oklahoma way back in 2002. So this is very old, but the picture really illustrates this beautifully. So if you look at the right-hand picture and the right-hand side of the right-hand picture, each of these silver-backed boxes is basically a PC, just like the PC on your lap or your desktop. Now, it's not structured. It doesn't look like a PC. It doesn't have the same shape as a PC, but it's got the same guts as a PC. It's made of the same components, pretty much. And then the left-hand side of the right-hand picture, that's a big network. In fact, that was a big expensive network, a uh, very fast network that connects all of these server computers together. And you can see the orange cable on the server computers hooking into the orange cable plugged into the um, switch. There's actually three switches working together. Okay. So what does an HPC cluster cost? Well, how much you got? All right, what do we need in an HPC cluster? Specifically, we've set a pile of computers, an interconnect, uh, and some software, but let's really dig down into the details of that. So the nodes, the computers, they're typically server computers, though in principle they could be workstations or even low-end junky PCs. Um, they provide various kinds of functionality. The number one kind, of course, being number crunching, but there are other functionality that we need as well. Then the interconnect, it's some kind of network switch or switches and network cables. And then there need to be network ports uh, in the servers, whether that's built into the motherboard or you have some kind of drop-in card. And then we need some storage and we need some software. All right, so what are the nodes? What are the computers? Well, the number one I mentioned is compute nodes. So these are computers that are highly optimized for doing heavy number crunching. So they've got high-end CPUs, typically with lots of cores. Uh, they've got a decent amount of RAM, and usually the amount of RAM you have gives you also the maximum RAM bandwidth, the maximum RAM performance. Um, they're also typically optimized to have as little disk as possible. And I'll talk about why in a little bit, um, and so on and so on. They've got a nice network connection as well. Uh, then you've got login nodes. So that's where users log in interactively. Now, if you've got a very small cluster, several of these functions might be mixed in the same node, right? If you've got a large cluster, they're usually done as separate nodes. 
So login nodes, people log in, they, that's where they're gonna compile their source code to get executables. They're gonna submit batch jobs. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they edit files, things like that, but they're not doing the heavy number crunching there. Then there are various kinds of support or management nodes. They run various administrative processes like the batch scheduler, uh, copying the operating system onto each node's disk, that's called imaging. Uh, there's typically a database of the users and so on and so forth. Now, where do we get this word node? Well, in graph theory, um, which is popular among computer scientists, but of course comes to us from mathematicians, you represent the relationships among things using a diagram like this. So these little circles, which are called vertices or nodes, are connected to each other using these little lines, which are called edges. And so the graph is the collection of nodes and the edges between those nodes. Well, when you've got nodes in a supercomputer, you've got the computers, the PCs, the servers in the supercomputer, and there's some switch or collection of switches that hooks them together, that's morally equivalent to that graph theory representation. And that's where the word node comes from. Let's talk about the interconnect. What do we need the interconnect for? Well, there's three common purposes. One of them is for the nodes to be able to talk to each other so that when they are, several of them are working on a problem much bigger than any one of them could do, then they can talk to one another and exchange information. The second purpose is for the nodes to be able to write stuff to disk and read stuff from disk or whatever storage you're using. And then the third purpose is for the sysadmins to be able to get onto the nodes to manage them. For example, to um, upgrade the operating system, or maybe there are some little local files that need to be tweaked or whatever it might be. Um, so depending on how much money you have to spend, it might be that you have separate networks for all of these, or it might be that you have one big network that covers all of them together, or it could be, you know, you have two networks, one for two of the things and one for the other thing. Any possibilities are there, right? What are the typical candidates? Well, Ethernet, of course, is the number one most popular network. And most clusters have an Ethernet network, even if it's just a low-end Ethernet for managing the nodes. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive. It's very reliable because Ethernet being super popular for every possible thing. Uh, is in use all over the world and is extremely well tested and extremely well debugged. Um, but on the other hand, it has poor performance in not in the sense of bandwidth. You can get very high bandwidth with Ethernet, right? Today, you can trivially buy 400 gigabit per second Ethernet. Um, so you got to figure 800 is not too far off in the future, or maybe it's terabit. Um, but the latency, the time for the first bit to show up on the other end, that's very high, relatively speaking, about 10 microseconds typically for a, a dedicated internal ethernet. InfiniBand, on the other hand, um, which technically is an open standard, but there's only one company that manufactures it, at least that I'm aware of, um, has a substantially higher price. It's much less well-tested because since it's a lot more expensive, there's a lot less of it out there, um, but it has much lower latency, about one microsecond. And then there are proprietary networks as well. Um, more often than not, those are tied to a specific vendor's compute hardware. Um, now for storage, typically what you're gonna have is one or more of the following. You might have servers full of disk drives, um, or maybe it's like what we call a JBOD, just a bunch of disks, an enclosure for disk drives, maybe attached to a login node or some other server, or some other node. Um, or you may have some other inexpensive chunks of storage, or you might have some high-end proprietary storage system, right? All of those are common depending on your budgets, your budget and your needs. And what kind of software would that be? Well, um, quite common is network file system or NFS. That's slow, but it's incredibly well tested. So it's quite reliable. Um, and it's typically built on top of something else. So over the years we've had at our institution, it's been built on top of ext3 or ext4, on top of XFS, on top of ZFS. Uh, there's other options as well. Now, on the other hand, you might have an open source 
um, large scale high performance parallel file system like Ceph or Lustre or OrangeFS or BGFS, there's many of them. Um, or you might have a proprietary one like GPFS from IBM, also now known as Spectrum Scale, WikaFS from WikaIO, OneFS from Isilon, which is now uh, under, which is now owned by Dell, PanFS from Panassas. There are many of these. Right. Uh, and then cluster software, you got to have the operating system. That's, of course, not specific to clusters. Most commonly, that's some form of Linux, although it doesn't have to be, and it isn't always. Um, and then there's um, a batch scheduler. So instead of you just typing a command and running it, let alone clicking on a button to run something, um, what you're going to do is submit a, sub a description of the run you want to do. And that run is going to go um, into a piece of software. That description is going to go to a piece of software that will decide when and where, which nodes your job will run on. Uh, then you need compilers, you have the user database, there's all kinds of things. There's, there's many, many different pieces of cluster software. All right, now let's talk about how um, the nodes of a cluster communicate with each other. I'm going to do it by analogy. So um, it's real easy if you're going to have a cluster, it's easy to imagine a job that needs only a single core or a single node, but many cores on that node, it's real easy to figure out how that's gonna work because that doesn't have to communicate over the network to anybody else. But if you have to communicate over the network, this is an analogy for that. So imagine you're on an island, you're in a little hut, like a little bungalow. And inside this bungalow, this is your vacation, right? Inside this little bungalow, you've got a desk and on the desk, you've got a phone, a pencil, a calculator, and two pieces of paper. One piece of paper, has a list of instructions, what to do. And another piece of paper has a collection of data, right? It's a big pile of numbers, what to do the instructions to, right? All right, so how's that gonna work? Well, so instructions, we really split into two flavors. One is the kind we're already accustomed to if we've ever done any kind of programming, which is, um, let's call it arithmetic and logic, uh, arithmetic and logical instructions like, Take the number in slot 27, add it to the number in slot 239, put the result in slot 71, right? That's very straightforward. That's an old friend. Or compare the number in slot 71 to the number in slot 118 to see whether they're the same value, right? Same number. But there's a new type of instruction that you may not have previously dealt with, which is a communication instruction. So remember, we have a phone on the desk. So think of it as, pick up the phone and dial 555-0127 and leave a voicemail. And in the voicemail, just say the number that is, that's in slot 962. So you're gonna call that, that phone number and you're gonna say 281.36, right? Which is the number that you found in slot 962. Or call your voicemail and get a voicemail from 555-0063 and that's gonna be a number, put that number in slot 715. So you call up and you hear someone on the other end say 28.4. And then in slot 715, you write 28.4, right? Now you're on a hut in an island, you don't have any awareness of anybody else, right? And as it happens, you don't need to, right? You don't know whether someone else is working on the problem with you or there's some weirdo who's leaving you voicemails or whatever. You don't know who that is. You don't know why they're doing it. And as it turns out, you don't really care. All you need to know is what voicemails should I send? And when I receive voicemails, what should I do with what's in the voicemail? Okay. Now suppose someone else is on another island somewhere. And they've got the same setup. So they're in the bungalow, they've got the desk and the chair, they've got the pencil and the calculator and the phone and the two sheets of, uh, the two sheets of paper. One is the list of instructions, one is the table of numbers, right? So they've got the same kind of setup, maybe different instructions, maybe different numbers, but the same basic setup, okay? And they are also leaving voicemails and collecting voicemails. Right, so far so good. And suppose there's another person on another island with the same thing. So they've got 
the desk and the chair and the phone and the calculator and the pencil and the two sheets of paper, list of instructions and a table of numbers, right? All of that, each of us has that. Now, none of us know what the meaning of the instructions we're following is, but we can follow the instructions perfectly well, even without knowing that. And none of us know who we're leaving voicemails for and collecting voicemails from, but we don't need to know that to follow the instructions, right? We get paid whether we know the reason or not. Yeah, we don't care, okay? But if the person who wrote the instructions and set up the initial tables of numbers. If that person is sufficiently clever, then it could be that all of us in this example are actually working together to solve a problem much bigger than any one of us could do on our own. Entirely unbeknownst to any of us, we could all be working together to solve one really big problem. Now, I not only don't know who's out there, or even the fact that there is someone out there, I just collect voicemails and leave voicemails. I don't know what it means, right? I also can't, if, if in fact they are out there, I can't see their sheet of, uh, their table of numbers, that sheet of paper, I can't see it, right? Their table of numbers is purely private. My table of numbers is purely private. They can't see it, right? The only way they get any information from me is if I call up and leave them a voicemail. Yeah, that's the only way we can communicate is by leaving voicemails. Now, it turns out when you make a long distance call, there's actually two costs to that call. There's a connection charge, a fixed cost that you're gonna pay no matter what. Now I realize nowadays, of course, we all have unlimited long distance within the US, but if you call another country, you're gonna deal with this. Right, there's, the, there's a charge for making the connection at all, even if you're only on the call for one second. And then there's a per minute charge, right? Now, way, way back in the 90s, there was this company that provided that service way back when long distance used to call ten, cost 10 cents a minute. There was a company called 1010220 that provided a long distance service, but they had a different business model. They said, we'll give you the first 20 minutes of this call for 99 cents. So that's five cents a minute, that's half off, right? And then after 20 minutes, if you stay on the phone for longer than 20 minutes, then it's 10 cents a minute after that, right? Great. So that sounds like a terrific bargain, doesn't it? Because the first 20 minutes is half price, right? Who doesn't like that? Except how long is a typical call? A typical call is far less than 20 minutes. The most common call is a minute or two. So let's say it's a minute and you're paying a dollar. Now you're paying a dollar a minute for that call, not five cents a minute. You gotta be on the phone for 20 minutes before you get five cents a minute. If you're on the phone for 10 minutes, then it's break even with the normal, what was back then 10 cents a minute, right? So this is a terrible deal. If you spend time thinking about it, you're getting, you're likely to get ripped off most of the time because most of the time you're not gonna be on the call for 20 minutes, right? So there's the connection charge, the fixed cost of making the call at all. And there's the per minute charge, the, the cost per unit of information. Well, distributed parallelism is a lot like that. So distributed parallelism, all of the processes running on the cores running on, uh, that are on the nodes, all of those processes are completely independent of one another. Arguably, you could say they don't even know the, each other exists. That's not literally true, but it's close enough. All the data are private. Processes communicate by passing messages. It's very much like voicemail. And the cost of a message is split into two pieces. The latency, call it the connection time. It's the time it takes for the first bit to show up at the other end. And then the bandwidth, bits per second. So in 2018, on our um, about to be decommissioned cluster, we actually did the benchmarking to find out what kind of numbers were we getting. And we found we were getting um, a latency of about one and a quarter microseconds and a bandwidth of about 37 gigabits per second. So that's about, um, a, let's see, a quarter of a 10th of a nanosecond per bit, 0.027 nanoseconds. 
per bit. So if we translate that, that's a difference of a factor of 47,000 or 4.7 million percent difference between the time it takes for the first bit to show up and the time it takes for each subsequent bit. A factor of 47,000, of 4.7 million percent, right? So that's like having a long distance service where it's $470 just to make the connection. And then one cent a minute after you've been on the call for a month. Now, if you've got that long distance plan, you're not gonna call mom every day. You're gonna call her on Christmas and you're gonna keep the phone off the hook with the connection still going until New Year's, right? Heck, you're gonna keep it going until the end of January because now that you've paid the $470, you might as well just talk to mom whenever you want to. So that's the analogy. That's how multi-node parallel computing works. And if you've heard the term MPI, message passing interface, that's what we've just described.